Okay, we're Hello. live. Okay, right, welcome, we're Mark. Thank you. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for having me. You. It's a pleasure being here. Do you want to flip that guy? Let's flip this guy over here. Normally, that's your job, right, Mike? All right, All right here we go. Sands of time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We're really excited about having you on board. Yeah, likewise. No, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, business? Yeah. So my name is Mark Abel. I'm an attorney and I've been doing estate planning since uh, 2009, uh, practicing law. I've got an office here. We just recently moved to Arcadia, California, um, purchased it from uh, a successor, Mr. Romanian, whom you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you're familiar yeah. with. And uh, so we've just been doing that and growing and going out and telling everybody about estate planning and the benefits and Excellent. things of that nature. So. I'll just speak a little bit closer sure. to your mic. Sorry. Great. That's great. So you've been practicing since what year? 2009. That's excellent. Yep. So you've come across a, all kinds of things. Wide variety. Yes. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So the topic today is living trust and estate planning. So let me ask you the first question. Um, who do you think needs a living trust today? So most people are probably going to benefit from having a living trust, um, particularly if you're living in the state of California and you own real estate, mm -hmm. you're definitely going to want to have a living trust. And particularly if you have kids that you want to pass property down to. So anybody in those two categories or anybody that basically wants to avoid probate uh, would also be a third category. So pretty probate is wide. a big deal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it casts a pretty wide net of people that would probably want to have a living trust, probably more people than not. So. Right, right. So a lot of people say, hey, you know, I just own a house and I just have a few bucks in the bank, this and that. Um, they probably should look into getting a living trust because if they don't, then the state is going to be handling their estate, right? The, the state of California. It's going to go through probate. Probate is very lengthy. I hear that it can take from one to two years, right? Um, yeah, it, I mean, it depends on the situation. So mm -hmm. we've actually got a case that um, 2019, it's still pending. It's still pending. Yeah. Wow. Um, Through probate. Correct. And it's um, very expensive. It can be, yeah. Um, so if litigation is involved in any probate, that can extend the time of it. Um, I know another attorney, he's been trying to get a probate through on a fairly large estate for as long as I've known him. So for at least 10 years. 10 years. So, so I got a question on that because probate probate's like a, a, a scary word for anyone in like in real estate or just in general like um, what happens to my assets who who decides who they go to it's a really you know at least for me like when I hear it it's like oh so but it doesn't typically take that long but it no. does typically take it can take it's timely and you you don't have control right that's the big thing with probate is you don't really know who things go to, like your properties, is that correct? So uh, one way that I like to think about it kind of is that you can set up an estate plan, which is a plan that you create yourself, right? If you do not plan for that, then the probate code sets up kind of like a one size fits all estate plan for everybody. And they rely upon what they call the intestacy statute, which is basically would determine where your property would go, right? So it would go to like your next lineal descendants um, and then the judge was just going to go down the line as to whoever is next in line. If somebody's passed away or predeceased, then they just go down the line on that one. So, like an example, let's say somebody uh, passes away and has no heirs, like in terms no. of like no children. Sure. Um, then they'd go probably to brothers, sisters, uh, well, first parents, uh, if the parents are predeceased, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, mm. grandparents, cousins. Got it. Further removed descendants. And then if they ca eventually can't find anybody, then it would um, go to the state of California. It's called a sheeting to the state of California. So it's very rare. I've never actually seen any property actually go to the state of California through an sheet. Um, I've seen it through kind of like lost property mm. claims where basically people have an asset in a state that they just didn't know about. And then all of a sudden they'll get a letter from somebody or we'll do due diligence on it. And they'll say, oh my gosh, you know, you, you have this asset here that... Uh, you know, we need to marshal, basically, which is collect from the state and get back into the estate of, uh, of the decedent. So. Got it. Got it. So okay. essentially, to keep it simple, just about everybody walking around today potentially will benefit from a living trust. Because if you own a house in the state of California and it has mm -hmm. any kind of equity in it, that right there will be extremely beneficial to get a living trust 
over going through the expense of probate and the time and and the fact that you you control the living trust as you, being the person that it's uh, the trustee right as opposed to the probate you know now you're in the courts you lose control correct um <clears throat> so when you're going through a probate the court basically has to maintain control over the assets and they have the authority to basically determine where the assets are going to go and they delegate that authority through what are called letters and court orders a series of court orders uh, to an administrator or an executor um, and that individual goes and they carry out kind of the day-to-day -day operations of uh, the carrying out the estate and closing it and administering it if you set up a living revocable trust if everything goes properly it was funded properly it was created properly then you nominate a successor trustee and that successor trustee is basically going to be delegated with the authority to go and marshal assets like close bank accounts, uh, deal with the IRS, obtain an EIN number, uh, sell real estate and things like that. And they do that largely outside of <clears throat> any type of court oversight. It's largely done in attorney's offices and things like that or trust administration offices. Um, now there are situations that arise where, you know, the trustee can get into issues or there may need to be a situation where there's clarification mm -hmm. or there may be situations where something wasn't done properly like for instance a house was not placed into the trust mm -hmm. and then they can always go to the court ask the court for guidance ask the court to place property into a trust if it wasn't funded properly or you know you can seek redress um, for verification of like if there's allegations of uh, misuse of trust funds or something like that right <clears throat> so. okay uh, go ahead well, how do you, how do you uh, deal with people that, like, let's say one, hu the husband is not for setting up a living trust, the wife is super for it, because some people are adverse to talking about death and what sure. happens afterwards. So um, for my purposes, I've got to have everybody on the same page because there's a, con a potential for a conflict of interest if we've got two people sharing the same property and one's on board and one's not off board. So for my purposes, I wouldn't do anything unless mm -hmm. both people are basically in agreement. Um, okay. But having said that, you know, there are situations where, you know, couples are together and they get divorced. They should still each revisit their individual plans at that point in time, because most likely if they did have a plan jointly, they're probably giving everything to the surviving spouse. And now that they're well, not on the best terms. Well, that's you a know, good they point. They want to revisit everything and make sure that yeah. everything's going to where they want to have happen. Um, mm. I haven't had it personally, but I have heard stories of people like having life insurance policy beneficiaries designated as an ex spouse, you know, and a policy that's sure. paid out to somebody. Correct. Yeah. You know, the ex. So. Well, yeah. that goes to the beauty of needing to update right. the things that you create. So, for example, the, the average person out there that owns a property, that has a job, has a 401k, that person will benefit from having a living trust. And then you, you create your own living trust. In other words, you, you, you put forth the things that you want to happen in the future. And then the trustee is the one that is in charge to carry out those ideas, right? Correct. With your help. Correct. So, when... Some people think that creating a living trust is very complicated. We're here to tell everyone today that it is not. You would, what, for example, when you say funding it, you would, you would help the person that comes to your office change the titles of their property, right? You would follow through on that and see that everything is done properly. Is that correct? Is that... Uh, Generally for most assets, correct, yes. For most so, assets. Yeah. So we typically always deal with um, the individual's real property. Um, I know there's other attorneys out there that they don't deal with funding any real estate. So sometimes I'll just send a set of instructions, you know, like here, draft a deed, go down the county recorder or something like that, mm. or it's on your own. Um, we find that that can be a little overwhelming Correct. to some people. So we always fund the real estate. Um, <clears throat> and then there's other assets, um, like for example, most banks don't want to talk to an attorney um, or it might not be, you know, feasible so like with bank accounts a lot of times it's just easier if we provide a certificate of trust which is a document <clears> that you can provide to the bank and just basically you know how to retitle out certain assets and things like that so. right so what i'm getting at is when someone comes to see someone like you they're going to have guidance yeah. throughout the process okay so 
Don't get overwhelmed with the idea that the living trust is very difficult. It just take the first step. Right. What is it that you want to leave your children, right? And then you put that down, they come to you, and you help them along the process. What do you tell someone that says, hey, you know what, I have a will, I don't need a living trust? I mean, a lot of, th what people don't necessarily realize about a will sometimes is that, you know, they want to avoid probate, so they go and they set up something, maybe a form they downloaded, maybe they actually went to an attorney and they had a will created, um, but when an individual passes away and they just have a will in place, they, whoever they nominate as the executor or the executrix uh, under that will needs to then take that will within 30 days, lodge the original with the Superior Court, wherever the county they passed away, and, and file a petition to probate the will. So they're still in another step a probate. Yeah. So if their goal is to basically, you know, provide assets in a distribution that they want and they have a relatively simple estate plan uh, or estate rather then a will can be sufficient uh, to avoid probate it's not going to avoid probate. it won't avoid no, probate. Yeah. Okay. but i mean if they just have something very simple maybe no real estate you know Got it. Stuff, something like that um, that may be sufficient for that individual's need but they still need to understand that look they're still going to be involved in a probate to some Got extent it. and so. the probate can take a very long time as you uh uh, explained earlier you know I, I own some property mm -hmm. and I remember with COVID everything shut down and I needed to get some permits mm -hmm. to do a couple of things in the property and it was shut down I couldn't get the permits signed things had to be done by email uh, oh you know we might be able to get this done whatever inspections were like very difficult to get done from the cities so you know, when you're involved with probate, and now I imagine that the probate system during the COVID time also got, uh, you know, uh, delayed, just like inspections and city order and things like this. So avoiding the court system through a living trust, you know, I think is the best thing because you never know what's going to happen. And right now, you know, it could take a year or whatever. But if something happens, it could take even longer. And as it takes longer, charges accrue? Is that how it works? Or? Um, so most probates, there's a probate statute that lays out a flat fee okay. that basically all attorneys that are doing, that are considering themselves probate attorneys, are going to charge because uh, it's set by statute. And the court is going to approve whatever that fee is going to be. Okay, So that's not necessary. And that's based basically on... Uh, uh, the value of the, the estate. The value of the okay. estate. So that is not going to okay. fluctuate regardless of time. What may impact it is that the longer that you continue, there may be additional issues that might occur. And there's a thing that it's called extraordinary fees or special fees for events of like if you needed to go fight or litigate a uh, foreclosure to prevent mm -hmm. a piece of property going into foreclosure, or yeah. if there was some issue that arose with title you need to file a quiet title action on to resolve, then the court may authorize extraordinary fees to deal with that. Um, but again, those fees might arise anyways, regardless of the length of time. So um, It's know. not necessarily a time thing where the fees accrue. It's kind of just, there's going to be, and on your brochure, which is excellent, which if you oh, have a, you. if you have a, um, PDF version or an online yep. version, we could link it if you have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, on the description, and we'll put all your contact information on the description as well, Mark. Okay, thank you. Um, but uh, just for my knowledge, does can can someone other than an attorney establish a living trust like a? Yeah. Okay. Um, it you know there's um, you know forms that are I've I've seen people have downloaded forms and have done it themselves. Oh really? Okay. Um, you know, there's services that do it themselves. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not necessary that you go to an attorney. I don't know that I would necessarily, I mean, obviously I'm biased, right? Sure, um, sure. I don't know that I would recommend that, you know? Right. I mean, Because I've some seen people it advertised. Won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, right. um, you know, some people <laughs> won't do certain things themselves, and then they'll just say, oh, maybe I can do an estate plan myself. Yeah. You know, I've seen some that have worked out reasonably well, but then there's also those that, have not turned out 
well. Sure. You know, and another so, thing and then, is that finding a living <clears throat> trust attorney, an estate planning attorney, right? Because there's attorneys that are all different kinds, right? right. Dealing with accident and personal <clears throat> injury, all that. But somebody like yourself that specifies, specializes. Specialize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question on the life insurance. You touched yep. on um, when you list a, a beneficiary as the trust on a life insurance policy. Um, how, the, when the person passes away, the death benefit gets paid now to the trust, right? As opposed to a live person. Um, are you familiar with the tax, um, the income tax? Um, how, if does it change at all? Like, because typically death benefits are income tax free in California uh, versus going into a trust. So yeah, like you said. Um... I'm not a tax professional, don't do income taxes, anything like that. You know, I got to throw out the disclaimer out there. Not yes, a licensed yeah. life insurance agent, don't mm -hmm. sell life insurance, mm -hmm. um, anything like that. But in general terms, uh, a life insurance policy is a contract between uh, the life insurance company. They have a measuring life and they have a beneficiary. And so an individual is going to pay into it. And upon the passing of the life that is being insured, then the payout is going to be paid to the named beneficiary. That can be an individual. Sometimes if the individual is under the age of 18, or maybe they are over the age of 18, but maybe the person who owns the policy doesn't feel that they're mature enough, then what you can do is you can name the trustee of a trust to receive that money hmm. and hold it for the benefit for health maintenance and support of the beneficiary until they reach a certain age or they reach a certain predetermined event like you know graduate college get a four-year degree something of that nature right and then you receive the money yeah. so you can instead of just having a check cut right away and have it held in a um, miners account or locked account or something like that you can have it paid to a trustee so they can manage the funds got it so the people they need to find out with their tax professional whether it changes that income tax um yeah, so we Peace. we kind of advocate like a team approach. So we'd like to work closely with life insurance agents, CPAs, state sure. planning attorneys, I love that. real yeah. estate agents. Um, you know, if they're doing any like ten thirty one administrators, if they're doing any type of properties. You know, I really business. like that um, because in order to do a good job for the person that's coming into your front door, you really need the team of people that have been working potentially with that person for years. Right. You know? And you need to know where they are in their stage of life. Some people are coming into you that are younger and they're in their stage of growth. Right. So they're still growing their portfolio, whatever it may be, stocks, whatever. Other people may come to you a little bit older, you know, like in their 50s. Mm -hmm. And they're not so keen on growth, they're more keen on preservation. Mm -hmm. And so and so forth and so on. So the people that they have been dealing with, that you bring them in as a team approach, I think that's absolutely right, spot on. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I love it. Let me touch on something that uh, you brought up with regards to some people uh, out there can do their own living trust and mm -hmm. put it together. You don't need to be an attorney to put together a living trust. Here's my humble two cents on that. Uh, I view that as doing surgery on yourself, <laughs> okay? Yeah. And um, there's only one guy in history that did a really good job on himself. He did surgery on himself. He was a Russian man. Right now, I can't remember, but he actually saved his life because nobody around him uh, was a surgeon. He was the surgeon, and um, he told everybody around him what they needed to do until he passed out, but, you know, <laughs> but he survived. So <laughs> um, you don't want to do surgery on yourself. Makes sense. Yeah. So what I would suggest is my humble to sense, and I have nothing to gain here other than to provide a tremendous value to our viewers, is find someone that you can trust that does this full time, right. okay, and, and consult with that person because you miss a dot, you miss a comma, you, you make something, you, you know, I would say... You know, get a consult with a professional and sure. let the professional take it over, you know? That's what I would say. Because if you're trying to do I this agree. on your I own, yeah. 
No, the, I don't. I think it's a it's a I was recipe re, I for was disaster. actually referring more to like I've seen court services people that do things like that paralegals, and I didn't know if I've always heard it's better to do this with an attorney. <laughs> but um, I have a question regarding the stepped up in the step up in basis. Mm -hmm. If you can share with us what that is and uh, how the living trust works hand in hand with that. So just in general terms, um, we'll start with basis. Basis is basically, just, you know, these are just kind of broad strokes. Um, the amount of money that you're going to basically be putting into an asset to acquire it for, and it's for tax purposes. Okay. So if you have a hundred, I mean, it's going to be a ridiculous example, but if you have a hundred thousand dollar house and you put 50 down, then your basis is likely going to be $50,000. There is fifty thousand dollars in equity that is going to be potentially uh, subject to uh, some type of tax later on, and then if there is an increase in value uh, through appreciation, some of that may also be subject to some type of tax later on. On the passing of a spouse, you get what's called a step up in basis, where whatever the value is as of the date of death, we go out and we do a date of death appraisal. Um, with the death certificate and the certified real estate appraiser. And we readjust the basis in that asset to the date, the value as of the date of death. So whatever the gains may have been, you may only have $50,000 put into the house and, but let's say it appreciated, then you would have basically the basis stepped up to the date of death valuation. So there's a way that we can assist with that. Is that, with a living trust only do you need that or is that just happens upon death um like with a will even <laughs> if you do if you do the proper steps it can happen both ways okay, okay. but there's this, there's like i say you need to get a date, date of death appraisal there's certain forms and deadlines that need to be filed um so as long as you're following the proper procedure it you should be able to achieve those results so the step up um, we were involved in the purchase of uh, property last year that the, the, the spouse passed away um, and then I believe they were able to go and after the, the spouse passed, put it in a trust and get that, uh, get that done. Is that possible? Um, um, so there's I a... may say on that that the value of that estate was minimal. We were uh, talking about a property that no, no, I'm talking about, I mean, it was a million dollar, uh, oh. the, the, four, the units. Um, he had bought it, this gentleman had bought it in the, oh. like 40 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. His basis was probably zero on it. And so he sold it for a million dollars, mm -hmm. roughly. So when the spouse passed, I believe after the fact, they put it into a trust, sold it with apparently minimal uh, tax, tax consequences. consequences. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? So there's a few things that may occur there. One is that if there is a joint trust between husband and wife and there's a piece of property that's left outside of the trust, but it was, there's evidence that it was intended to be placed into the trust during mm -hmm. their lifetimes. Uh, there's a case called Hegstead. Um, and basically you can file a petition, 850 petition with the probate court and just say, you know, your honor, this was really intended to be placed into the trust for X, Y, Z reasons. It wasn't, but you know, can you please allow us to post death, place it into the trust as if it were always an asset of the trust. So there is a procedure for doing that. Oh, interesting. I wouldn't rely on that. No. Uh, because there are situations when those are denied. Right. Uh, but, I mean, there is a, you know, if the facts are right, there's a situation where that may be used. So. Mm. Excellent. Okay. And I know that what we're doing is to get a general overview, okay, okay. to the public so that they can understand a little bit more what a trust is all about and who needs it and so forth. I have a few folks that I told, hey, we're, we're going to be doing a living trust uh, yeah. uh, and estate planning podcast. And the question that overwhelmingly came up was, well, how much? How much is it going to cost? <laughs> yeah. And I told them, well, that's going to be very difficult to, to say in, to a certain extent because if you have a small estate, you know, and it's easy and clear cut, compared to a very large portfolio of whatever and kind of complicated, but more or less uh, an average uh, trust, uh, what do you have like a, an idea of a price or 
I know it's very difficult, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but just to throw out like a figure out there, kind of. And of course, it's not set in stone, because if things get complicated, the more time involvement and so forth. But uh, uh, is there such a thing as an average cost? or? Yeah, so, I mean, like you said, everyone's situation is different. Some people have more property than others. Um, some people have different needs than others. So, you know, we do tailor everything. You know, there's going to be different prices associated with all that. But in general, I mean, there's uh, $2,500 to $3,500 is going to be kind of maybe like the going range of trust that you would find for, you know, attorneys probably in the area. Um, you know, there's others that you see deals where it's like, usually you see them on like the side of a row, there's like a sign, you know, 750 or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so it just kind of depends on, I guess, on the level of service and the right. level of the product that you might be getting. Um, and one thing is that that's interesting about these is that oftentimes you don't find out about the, how well the trust was prepared until after the individual passed away, you know, sure. and you go through and you're actually administering it and dealing with everything. So, um, of the school belief that you want to make sure that everything's done properly up front and sure. at least have it reviewed so that way it stays up to date and assists everybody with you know exactly how they want their wishes carried out. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, this might be a good time to throw in that uh, you're okay with uh, our subscribers. If one of our subscribers contacts you, you're willing to sit with them for 30, 40 minutes, complimentary kind yeah. of thing if it's on a, in estate a planning or living trust. That's excellent. Thank you for doing that for us. Okay. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. So, yeah, that's for our subscribers, okay? So make sure you subscribe. Um, um, I, had, I had a question regarding liability because like in real estate, um, I feel estate planning is extremely important with, with people who have real estate. I don't know if, does that sound? Yeah. Yeah, that's typically. Exactly. So um, you buy a property under an LLC for protection to separate it from yourself. Mm -hmm. When you set up a living trust, and let's say you have a portfolio of properties, maybe you have five or ten, and you put all of them into a living trust, are you taking away some of the protection that separating it from yourself had? So there's different types of trusts. Um, the types of trusts that we prepare mostly are called revocable living trusts. Okay, They're revocable because you can change them. Speak Sorry. Of <laughs> so, no. uh, revocable? Re revocable because you can change them, amend them, uh, restate them uh, while you're alive and um, because of that you can put property into them take property out they don't really offer you any asset protection in terms of what one would typically consider to be asset protection because that's not the primary purpose the primary purpose is probate avoidance mm -hmm. Um, so if you have a property in an LLC, then typically what you would do is then you would place the LLC, you would leave the property in the LLC and then place the LLC in, uh, in the trust. ownership interest in the names of the trustee. Exactly. Um, so you get are, the best of both worlds. Correct. There are other types of asset protection trusts that can, can be set up. Um, I don't do those, um, uh, but I know there are, you know, other attorneys that specialize in asset protection and things like that. Um, and that would be more like if someone was interested in doing that, they would be more geared to, you know, finding an individual that, that would do that. Okay. So just to recap, um, if you have a couple of properties that you have bought, you put them in your LLC. So the LLC gives you that liability protection. Okay. Then you take that LLC and you place that LLC inside of the living trust. Yes. The ownership interest. The ownership yeah. interest, right? Okay, so you do that. So by doing that, the properties that are within the LLC now are within the ownership is in the living trust, okay? And they, the person that's the uh, trustee will carry out your wishes without having any, uh, potentially any issues. Is that correct, more or less? That's more a, or less, yeah. And, and again, the main purpose of doing that is that, so let's say you have individual A that's the managing member of the LLC and they pass away. You don't want to have to go probate the LLC right. and have maybe a receiver appointed or uh, another right. individual appointed by the court to manage the LLC. Correct. You want to already have a successor in place through the terms of the trust that can step in and manage the asset. Correct. So the way I look at it, to simplify things for me, right, and maybe even our viewers, what we do is we think of the living trust as a uh, holding 
type of vesicle or something? I think that's apt. Okay. Okay. So the living trust is like a big basket. And then what you do is different things that you own, like uh, whether it's um, a bank account or uh, properties, LLCs, an LLC here, whatever, you throw that into that basket, which is the living trust, and thereby you set up your estate completely and it protects you, it, your wishes. Who do you want this to go to? Who do you want that to go to? And the, this basket avoids probate, which could be very lengthy and, and costly. We just went over that, okay? But it also gives the trustee control, a lot of control, as opposed to the court setting up someone to do whatever. And if some of those assets are not in the basket, then they could be probated, potentially. Potentially, correct. So for our viewers, when they come to someone like you, you're going to help them based on what they want to do with their assets and who they want to give it to, put it together, make sure that the trust gets properly funded, the titles get changed. You help them with all of that, correct? Exactly. Right. So you don't have to be overwhelmed <clears throat> by some of the issues that people say, hey, you know, it's completely overwhelming. Uh, all you have to do is take the first step. And I really do think that there's a tremendous amount of benefit. And keep in mind that let's say you open the living trust today. Uh, a year from now, you may need to update it. Don't just open it and forget about it. You have to contact him again because if there's a divorce down the line, unfortunately, if there's a death in the family, what happens if your trustee that you have assigned passes away before you or, you know, one of your children, God forbid. There's just a lot of things that happen in yeah. life that, you know, but now you have a trusted individual corporation right. that does this full time, you know that can assess those issues. Would you agree with some of that? I think it's, yeah. Okay. I think it's accurate. Can you, Mark, um, talk to us a little bit about the, the unified credit um, and why that's so important for like higher net worth cli uh, clients and individuals? Sure. So just in general terms, this isn't going to apply to, just statistically, this is not going to apply to the majority of people. Um, sure. Basically... <laughs> There's a few goals that estate planning and setting up a living trust sets uh, sets out to accomplish. Like I said, the first being to avoid a probate, and the second being to avoid any type of state tax. Okay, so right now in California, on the state level, we're not concerned about any type of tax um, passing. Uh, when I say any type of tax, I mean any type of like a state tax uh, taxing the passing of an estate from one generation to another. It doesn't exist right now. <clears throat> right. Okay. On the federal level, you are concerned about it, but there's an exemption that's just so high that most people aren't going to deal with it, right? So we're really dealing with more than $11 million per an individual, more than $20 million per a couple. Um, once you start getting into that, you are going to get into a trust that's going to require some federal estate tax planning. Um, and again, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, <clears throat> I'm not a CPA, I don't do taxes, but we would meet with somebody that is a specialist in federal estate tax planning. Um, and they would set up a way to um, <clears throat> deal with what's a, a concept that, that's called portability, which is transferring an estate tax credit or an exemption from one individual to another, typically a spouse that is predeceased to a surviving spouse in order to avoid having to pay tax at a federal level. So. And it could be very, uh, what a, uh, very beneficial for them to do that and set that up in advance because the tax rate is just so exorbitant um, at the federal level. Once you start hitting the tax, you're looking at like 40% tax rate. 40%. So let's say for that, that one individual, this, in, this couple that does, um, <clears throat> this will apply for, if they have an estate that has, you know, and you give an example, but let's say they had an estate that is a million dollars over what the, it, would, it, would it be an exclusion? Uh, uh, an exemption. An exemption. An exemption. Mm -hmm. um, then it could be 40% tax on the million dollars, which... If they did no planning. Yep. If they did no planning. That's $400,000. That's a lot of money that it's could go towards. Yeah. And one thing that um, 
in the life insurance world, I, that was my previous career. Okay. Um, we, life insurance, if you have a very large life insurance policy or multiple, those are all added to your estate, correct? What? Yes, uh, there's a tool that's frequently used called um, an irrevocable life insurance trust. Okay. Sometimes it's abbreviated as like an islet. And the theory behind that is that basically if there is, and again, this would take a lot of planning with a tax professional that does a lot of right, this right. And, or an estate planning attorney that specializes in uh, doing federal estate tax returns and things like that. Um, generally, <clears throat> if they believe that there would be some federal estate tax, you can kind of get a ballpark as to what you think that would be. Yeah. Uh, have a life insurance policy placed in an irrevocable trust that may be uh, payout upon death that would take care of that tax. Okay. So. Correct. And sep and that would separate it from your actual estate. Yeah. So, so that's very complicated. We're right. a little more involved so, than yeah. typical. Yeah. I think it's yeah, a good so. time to share here that with our viewers also that, for example, a living trust, you go from basic and there's basic uh, a you know, living trust that you put together, but there's also advanced state planning, okay? Yeah. And so what we're trying to do here is to give them a general overview of how beneficial having a living trust is. Mm -hmm. And some people may fall into that advanced category where there's also a charitable living, a charitable remainder trust. Correct. Okay, so depending on your portfolio, and depending right. on how big, of, how large of assets you have, you can create... And the loss, right, which changed, because not too long ago, it, it was only five and a half million or so per, per, well, not only, but it was five and a half per person, 10 million or 12 million, now it's in the 20s. So that's a huge difference only a few years ago. Right, yeah. so, but, but the idea is, you know, to give a general overview, but also the, 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 Take the first step, and the first step is talking to your spouse or, or yourself. Do some introspect and say, what do I want to do with what I've built throughout my life, no matter what age you are. Some people at a younger age build more. But the trust, the living trust can get complicated. You can set sure. up a charitable remainder trust. You can set up an irrevocable trust to hold the life insurance. So, But that yeah. comes up when you put everything on the table and you say, this is what I've got, what do you think? Yeah. And, you know, you can take se several opinions, you know, and so forth, but the first step is to get started. Correct me if I'm wrong. So we have established that you don't set up a living trust to uh, take a income tax advantage in any way, because the living trust is not going to help you with income taxes. Yeah, in general, when you set up a living revocable trust, there is um, you're just going to use your own social security numbers that are associated with the individual um, that's going to be applied for the living revocable trust. Right. Okay. Upon the passing, uh, it can it's typically going to become irrevocable, and then at that point, it'll apply for a separate uh, employer identification number, right. or taxpayer identification number with the IRS. So the but idea is in you, you general terms, it's I mean, it's not going to... Not for income tax. Not for income tax right. and again, purposes. I don't do taxes. So, yeah. right. right. No, and, and you've put but out there, your you know, disclaimer. Form, he's not a CPA. That, you know, he's, some not, tax, uh, he's an attorney. He's not a CPA. Thing. He's not a life insurance agent. And this, <laughs> yeah. this, no, he is an attorney. Is, I mean, no, he is an yes. attorney. Did I say he's not? <laughs> yeah. He is, oh, no, he is an attorney. He's not a CPA. He's not a life insurance agent. He is an attorney. Do your own research. Sure. But we've this done some research. This is general research. information. Right. And, yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, um, it's it's not necessarily either for asset protection, but you get those two items in the way that you set up your living trust. You get those two items like um, by osmosis to a certain extent by the way you set it up. Because if you if if you're thinking of asset protection and you buy your property in a in a in an LLC, well then you put the ownership of the LLC in the trust, and there you go, <laughs> right? so to speak so the the llc as long as you're you know doing everything properly so no one's going to you know with this like, pierce the corporate veil or anything like that as long as you're doing everything properly the llc is going to be the primary vehicle that's going to provide the most asset protection correct um but the purpose the primary purpose of the revocable living trust is to basically ensure that there's a continuity of management after the after the one of the managing members 
passes away, right? And there's other vehicles that you can do that with too. You can also do it with like a buy sell agreement, just individually within the LLC membership. So. Excellent, excellent. Now, um, you talk a lot about incapacitation as well in sure. your brochure, and your and we talked a lot about death already, like when someone yeah. passes. But how does incapacitation mm -hmm. come into play? And then also, can you touch on which a lot of families have special needs? Uh, individuals in their family. You beat me to the How does that, yeah, yeah the special <laughs> trust. But if you could start with the incapacitation. Please. please. Yeah, so incapacity, um, going back to kind of what we first started with at the beginning, you know, some individuals might set up a will and think they're covered, um, but they might not necessarily think about other situations other than the finality of passing away, which may be a situation of incapacity. And incapacity can come in many forms. Um, had, you know, I, I knew an individual who was um, young, healthy, got into a horse riding accident, and for all intents and purposes, could no longer continue doing their job anymore. Yeah. Um, so we consider that essentially an incapacitating event, right? So you have to have a full time care manager. Uh, there's other types of like where an individual may be physically healthy throughout their lifetime for quite a long time, but mentally may deteriorate. To the point where they can't manage what we call activities of daily living anymore either it's like an alzheimer's dementia something like that um, where you know they might need care management for you know paying bills you know yeah. going Showering. to the grocery store shower and things yeah. like that you know cooking even um, in case they would leave yeah. the stove on for too long or something like that and if you have so, a living trust someone that's that can be resolved through the living trust in a private manner and quickly if you're in probate, then the court has to assign someone, right? Yeah. And that so could take if you're forever. if you're gonna if you don't have anything in place, you would typically be looking at if an individual was under the eighteen years of eight, eighteen years, years of, age. of age or under, uh, they would be filing a petition for a guardianship typically, and then if they're over eighteen, they'd be filing a petition for conservatorship to basically have someone appointed as a conservator over the individual to either manage just their financial aspect of their lives, which would be uh, conservatorship over the estate or managing kind of like the day-to-day -day healthcare decisions that that individual would be required to undergo, and that would be over the person. So below 18 is a guardianship, over 18 is a conservatorship. Correct, and that's just through the pro, that's how they, what we call the probate court, that's how they would classify And those my two cents on that, that is a huge benefit that the living trust can offer, okay, over just having a will and having to, that it's huge. Okay. Can you give us an example, Mark, of like somebody who establishes a living trust? They're in their fifties mm -hmm. and they're concerned about mentally them not being all there and all sound in the future. What would they, what could they do? Just an example of how they can protect themselves. Yeah. So just to start off with, again, if you're creating a living trust, you these are legal documents um, that need to be executed when you have full capacity, right? And Correct. So everybody's got to basically, when these documents are executed, they got to be put in place when an individual's competent to do so. Um, if they're concerned about that in the future, essentially how it would work is that they would nominate, we could put care management provisions into the living trust, we could have a durable financial power of attorney, uh, financial health care directives and things like that where they can nominate successor individuals to basically carry out those roles, mm -hmm. which would be someone whom the, they trust and have confidence in, not just an individual that maybe they do not want to be in charge of those roles at a future date. Got it. And that will kick in when a doctor or multiple doctors, and you, you mm -hmm. put it here, you could even say, like, I want multiple doctors to have to have said, I'm not of sound mind anymore, right? Yeah, there's a few different types. There's um, some that are um, immediately effective upon the individual signing the document. Mm -hmm. uh, there's others that are only effective if a singular doctor or physician signs off on their incapacity. And then there's others where you can even have uh, multiple doctors or panels uh, determining whether wow. the individual is competent or not, depending on the extent of you know the assets that are involved. Very, very cool. Very interesting. Another point that I wanted to bring up very quickly, we're getting to the end okay. here soon. Well, it's yeah. gone fast. Is, Thank uh, you for your time. <laughs> Thank you for your time. We truly appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, definitely. 
um, you're a wealth of knowledge. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so one of the things that I wanted to say also, and I'd like your feedback on this, um, a will, the person that says, hey, I've got a will, don't worry about it. Uh, one of the things that I always learned through my years in, in business is that a will can be con contested by a long lost distant cousin that you've never seen. They can come in and say, hey, you know, my I talked to my uncle or whatever or nephew, you know, and they were going to leave me this and that can be contested. Whereas a living trust is much, much more difficult to contest because in order to contest, you're going to have to bring about a lawsuit, correct? So, uh, so if an, tell me where I'm wrong. In this. <laughs> so if Please. an individual is going to contest a will, they would typically file a will contest, uh, which would essentially be litigation within the, if there's an existing probate, it would be litigation within the existing probate. Mm -hmm. um, or they could seek to probate a second competing document that they would allege is the true will. Okay. Um, most attorneys if they're drafting a document are going to put what we call a no contest clause in there and the there can be various uh levels of no contest uh i guess various uh expanses of of how broad that's drafted it could be kind of minimal it could be more uh, broadly construed and drafted um, with respect to a trust there are also trust contests and there's trust litigation Okay, so, and there's also multiple basis, bases for that being brought. One could be, you know, an individual wasn't in the right mind when they signed the documents. One could be the trustee has essentially mismanaged the assets of the trust. Um, and then another could basically be, you know, I guess it would kind of fall on some of the same lines as the first, which is basically the distribution is not correct and somebody was eliminated from the trust. Um, and those are just in general terms. Obviously, I don't comment on any pending litigation that we do. But um, so there still can be trust litigation involved. And that would also be in the same general departments, which would be considered the probate court. Um, it would just, one would be considered an estate matter, one would be considered a trust matter. So both could be contested. But both one be, has the more trust, protection. Well, the trust would typically... The, the will would typically have a no contest clause and a trust would also typically have a no contest clause. Right. Mm. Yeah. But some things that I've seen across my experience in business is that uh, one time a living trust was contested, but uh, the distribution happened so quickly that, uh, you know, and it's what the decedent wanted. Uh, it, the contestment in this particular case was outrageous. Um, the distribution of the assets were done way before anything else could was done on that particular one and the decedent's um, will was carried through hmm. so that, that that was one that i and and i also been trustee uh in in a, in a living trust where um the person that passed left everything uh to a person that wasn't a family member at all mm -hmm. and i was involved with that one and the family all got up in uproar and um, it was a very interesting situation you know when you're living these things, I was a trustee for that, and it was a very awkward, and um, it was a very interesting experience uh, in my life. And this is one of the reasons I say, don't do surgery on yourself. Make sure that you have an attorney that does this full time, help you with something like this, and you have all the time in the world, right? Just get it started, find somebody. Of course, we're, we're gonna recommend Mark, but, um, that time in my life was, um, it took a lot out of me. It was emotionally draining. I had to deal with family members were, that were completely distraught. And then you get pulled into things. Uh, so, uh, you know, in this particular trust, the person that passed left everything to the caregiver, okay? Mm -hmm. Not to any family members. And it was something to go through, uh, that experience. So anyway, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, do you have a, another question or? It, yeah. Well, I did want to just, uh, on the special needs trust. Yes. Yes. Um, cause we kind of brushed a little on it, but, um, where would, where would somebody need to establish something like that? If you could just briefly kind of touch on that. Sure. So, um, in general, uh, there are some individuals that require more care in certain aspects of their lives. Um, and a lot of times the parents are providing that care. 
um, if it's for a family member or you know other family members are providing that care and they want to ensure the same level of care should anything happen to them should they have ill health or pass away they want to make sure that they have a continuity of care and that it's at the same level so they would nominate basically a successor trustee that can take over on a special needs trust and the general overview um, of that special needs trust is if it is set up that basically you would have assets that would pass into a special needs trust it would be its own separate yep. trust and um, it's got there's a quite a few intricate rules and things of that nature that need to be explicitly followed um, so this is a type of trust I would definitely not recommend anyone go out and um, set up on their own um, but essentially assets would flow into the special needs trust those assets could be used for certain benefits for the individual to maintain them at their current lifestyle while they would also be able to apply for certain um, potentially needs-based programs that are available um, like government assistance yeah. 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 yeah yeah so it can be very helpful oh for and let me tell you i'm a lot older than both of you guys you guys are very young okay so i'm a lot older than you guys and i'm here to tell you and you guys know this too and everybody does that uh, life changes on a dime on a dime okay and uh you may not have the need for special needs trust today but you you just never know what can happen right okay so yeah uh, yeah absolutely um right yeah. well this has been very informative. Very is helpful. there anything else that you wanted to throw in that you think might be helpful? I know we covered a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, I we just covered a to, lot. Yeah, no, I just want to thank you guys for having me here. I really appreciate oh. it. It's been a pleasure getting. Thank to you know very you much, so. and you were very gracious to, you know, for our subscribers to give them a complimentary 30, 40 minutes uh, uh, sit with you uh, on estate planning, and we appreciate that very much. So please subscribe and share this. The idea of this podcast is to bring a general overview okay on living trust with this gentleman here and he's very knowledgeable very professional that's why we chose him and um, I hope it helps everybody and share with everybody out there this is um, something that I think um, potentially everybody needs yeah you know especially, especially nowadays with so much litigation on everything yeah. all right well thank you very much all right, thank you thank, thank you so much thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. pushing that button one more time